So I, uh, I want to thank that excellent panel. Um, I think they have uh, they addressed, as, as someone pointed out, uh, a lot of the issues that we've talked about in the past day and a half. And I, I think that's, uh, that, that's important and a good, because the government has a role. And, I, and, and what I tell people is it, it, where I see geospatial data coming is where industry, government, and increasingly the crowd are both data users and data providers at the same time. And that raises some real interesting challenges in terms of how you regulate this and how you deal with it. So um, I want to, I, I, I think, you know, we, some of the issues, and, and particularly, and I, I think she, um, she may have stepped out about the, about the Yahoo and the question, how do, you, how do you deal with some of the newer technologies and the ways that it can be used? And I think just thinking about it is an important step. And hopefully that's, you know, conferences like this will start getting people to do it. And I think we have our final speaker. Yes, here he is. Um, Kalistas Juma, he, uh, he spoke earlier yesterday. He, um, he's going to sort of summarize, I think, sort of where we are and what we've learned and, and maybe some next steps, if, if we're lucky. I, I always get these tasks which are really easy, like closing sessions. <laughs> I, could just, I could just say it. <laughs> the conference is over. <laughs> And everybody, everybody goes home. I just uh, I want really to, to, to thank everybody who uh, managed to come, but also to stay here for this really interesting and, and uh, challenging area of, of, of public policy. I was uh, reflecting on uh, what I could actually say today and it seemed that the last panel, in my view, kind of summarized the kinds of approaches one might want to take uh, in a case of this kind, uh, which is a, a technology that offers a great promise, but at the same time uh, carries with it uh, the perception of risks. And really the big, the big issue here is not so much the actual risks, but it's the perception of risk that tends to drive uh, public debates around, uh, around emerging technologies. And uh, I, let's see, this is a, it, it's really driven by a, a point that uh, Doug mentioned yesterday, which is this exponential growth uh, in technology and unprecedented growth with the estimates of a doubling of technical capability in this field uh, every 12 months. Uh, and if you think about that, it's not possible to conceive of any policy setting that can actually evolve that fast. And so you, you really end up with situations where policy approaches always lag way behind the advancement of the technology. Uh, and the danger here is that if the policy lags way too far behind, uh, you could easily get a backlash uh, with the general public getting more and more concerned about perception of risk, and uh, which then get exaggerated. And that could create some challenges. We've seen this happen in a variety of fields. Uh, I work a lot in the area of in aid of transgenic crops, and that's exactly what happened, uh, where the technologies were ahead of institutions, and the re general response was basically to try to pull it back. Uh, and, and by trying to do that, you also then forgot the benefits, the benefits of the technology. In addition to just this exponential growth uh, in knowledge, you also have really a shortening of time frames between product development and commercialization, and we've seen that in a variety, in a variety of fields. So it, it creates really unique, unique public policy challenges that you can only address in an experimental way. And my view is that on this one, the more diversified your experiments are, uh, the, the more likely that you'll get uh, lessons that work in, in the different locations. And secondly, that it, this is an area where there's so much diversity in needs and uses that it would have to be done on a case-by-case -case approach. So, so generic policies that are either global 
or international are really unlikely to work in, a, in circumstances of this kind. Uh, and so, uh, but at the same time, we're starting to see renewed interest in advancing, particularly in the area of engineering sciences. I've just, I've been very blessed recently to serve uh, on the jury of the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering, which is a, a one million pound prize that will be awarded, uh, in fact, later this year to people who have developed <coughs> the internet uh, and the web. And uh, part of that enthusiasm to try to push forward uh, technological advances is driven by the view that unless we, start, we invest more, particularly in engineering, uh, we're unlikely to solve uh, many of our economic problems as well as eco ecological and governance ones. And so we have this paradox where you have greater concern and about public policy governing emerging technologies at a time when <laughs> policymakers are starting to think that we actually need to invest more in harnessing existing technology for uh, e economic growth generally. And the people who are leading this process are not insignificant people. Uh, they are presidents of leading universities like Stanford, uh, former president of uh, of MIT is part of that group, uh, former president of Tokyo, University of Tokyo. And, and so we're starting to see a, a renewed interest in focusing on public policy that in fact involve a refocusing of attention on the engineering sciences where I consider the geospatial technologies to fall in that category. Uh, University College London, University College of London is going to launch a new program in September on science, technology, engineering, and public policy. So for the first time, we're starting to see engineering starting to feature as an area of public policy interest in its own right. And in fact, the reason why it's starting to feature is simply because of the kinds of concerns that we've been discussing here in the, in the last couple of days. And, and so the, 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 the observation I'm making is a really renewed interest in a starting to focus more on how to deal with the science and technology policy under conditions of uncertainty and exponential growth in scientific and technical knowledge. Uh, in the past, we never had those opportunities so we could rely on economic models as a guide on how economies change uh, over time and that was projected to technological change, assumptions about equilibrium. You cannot think of equilibrium in this kinds of setting. And, and so, so it's really interesting that the, the new policy school that is being set up at University College London <coughs> uh, is not in the social sciences department, it's in, a, in, the, depart in the faculty of mathematics and applied, applied sciences, uh, which is essentially people who are on a day-to-day -day engaged with advancing these technologies, really starting to take charge of the, uh, of the, the policy elements of it and, and trying to develop new policies that reflect the character of the technology itself rather than a traditional social science uh, approaches that then get imposed on the way we deal with, the, uh, with emerging technologies. I was going to show you a movie of this, but I'll just, I'll just skip, skip that. This is a, I mean, I wanted to show this, this map for a very specific reason, which is that this is not just an issue uh, of the United States or the industrialized countries. In fact, the level of investment in the developing countries uh, to, to catch up technologically is really dramatic. This is, a, this is essential the way Africa looked uh, not long ago, uh, 2000 and 2009, with this entire eastern coast of Africa without having any connectivity to, to undersea cables, basically without broadband access. Uh, this, that's what Africa looks like just in, in, a, in a period of three years. Uh, this is a roughly between three and four billion dollars invested in fiber optic cables around the coast, around Africa, in three years. A large proportion of that investment, uh, in fact, coming from the private sector, and this is a African investors. The bulk of it is really. Uh, African investors. This, the, the trigger was this cable by a company called Seacom, uh, which is a, a $165 million investment. 75% of the shareholders, uh, of the shareholding is African. 
and that is going to starting to change the way even African countries think about the same issues you've been discussing here because they have already made those investments and made them really, really fast. Now, the four, the four to five billion dollars is only the undersea cables. Just over that same period, the terrestrial cable investment in this region alone is roughly seven to eight billion dollars. Again, a large proportion of that uh, is, is domestic investment, parts of it are government investment. And the point that was made earlier, here where government is both an investor and a regulator, is really acute in these cases, because governments would like to recover their investments, but at the same time, they are also the ones under pressure to guarantee uh, uh, security, to deal with the confidentiality questions. Uh, and so this is really, a, I mean, a, it is a global issue. Uh, in every respect of, of, of the world. And in some parts of the world, th this is a, in a policy setting where they didn't have, the many of these countries don't have yet a science and technology policy. Uh, so they don't have a platform uh, upon which they can construct a privacy policy. Uh, and so they are starting to, with this privacy before they have actually developed a science and technology policy. So they're, they're again, very pragmatic, basically working on a, on, on a trial and error basis and trying to figure out what to do. At the same time, the emergence of a large number of private enterprises, startups, uh, some of which just are meeting local needs with apps for a variety of, a variety of things, but uh, uh, some of them having large contracts for leading players like Hollywood. So you get startup companies doing animation in Western Kenya, in a kind of boutique startups. Uh, but they have five million dollar contracts for uh, for Hollywood. So the, the policy issues there are not just domestic issues, but they, they are also linked to what happens uh, in, in the industrialized countries themselves. Uh, and so, so the real issue really is one of risk uh, in that as we all move towards the, the greater use of these technologies, how do we manage the risks uh, associated with it? With it? And, and I would say fundamentally, it comes down to this question of trust. And there's something we know a little bit about understanding the risk, risks of new technologies uh, derived from historical studies. Uh, that if there is a general perception that the benefits of a new technology are going to accrue to a small section of society, but the risks are likely to be spread widely, you get a pushback. And that's where the role of the private sector, especially when large corporations are involved, they tend to intensify, purely on the basis of perception, that only a small number of enterprises are benefiting from this technology and the risks are likely to be spread worldwide. So, so you, get, you get pushback on that. The other thing that we know from management of risk, or risk perception, is that uh, if there is a perception in society that the benefits of a technology will occur, will emerge over the long run, but the risks are likely to emerge in the short run. Again, you get a pushback. Uh, and in, there have been some technologies where have combinations of both. And then people are wondering, what, where did that opposition come from? Uh, because we are not doing enough in understanding uh, how societies construct risk, uh, especially not real risk, but perceived risks. It's uh, all the political drama around new technologies are driven essentially by, uh, by, 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 perceived, by perceptions of risk as, a, as opposed to actual risks. So you have issues that basically, uh, big issues that we have already been discussing here the last couple of days, uh, which basically uh, where you have this virtual persona. And I, I'm, uh, this is kind of bringing me back to some discussions that have taken place in other areas of technological endeavor that have a lot of relevance to, uh, to these discussions. The copyright questions, we've already uh, touched on that. This was really the first area of discussion over, over started about 30 years ago. In fact, about 50 years ago, uh, with, with, the, with the discussions over copyright, we have had the emergence of the open source movement. Uh, some issues have been resolved in that space. Uh, others have not, others are yet to be resolved. Uh, and I had some interesting discussions here on uh, ownership of data, Sa same debate that is taking place in the area of genetic resources or, 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 or genomics on whether 
uh, the, the, this could be owned differently, so you could separate the ownership from the use uh, in terms of legal arrangements. And, and that's a, a very interesting debate that is actually not going to go away, but a subject matter of ex extensive uh, public policy interest. Uh, you discussed, of course, pr privacy uh, questions, and some people have an easy way of thinking about how to fix that. <laughs> it, will, yeah, it, could, it, could, it may help a little bit, especially in your, if you are a young person in your parents' uh, room, but uh, it, does, it doesn't really help very much. Uh, others have a more ingenious ways of uh, thinking about how to guarantee their, uh, their privacy, especially in the public places. They just, again, uh, I think the, in the olden days, I've always wondered, having grown up in a village in Western Kenya, that uh, there was never really any privacy, and the only way you could have privacy is to just disappear and go into the bush and lie down and keep a low profile, uh, or go up a tree when nobody's watching and you can stay in the tree. And you, you can violate other people's privacy, but you are at least hidden somewhere. Uh, in, the, in the modern world, there isn't a place to place to hide and and even if you try to them your own metadata will catch you <laughs> so so and then, then you you have a confidentiality questions again you you had some really interesting discussions of that over the last few days uh, with a how to deal with surveillance this is a big issue uh, with various governments around the world the balancing between uh, law enforcement and uh, and the privacy of individuals as a some significant area of debate within the United Nations uh, system with more and more government wanting to have control uh, of the of the platform so they can use it for the same same reasons so I remember a very interesting conversation in uh, in London I was giving a talk at the Royal Society of London uh, Royal Academy of Engineering and somebody flew in all the way from Nigeria to come and tell me something I had no clue about. He said, the reason we in the intelligence system are opposed to the privatization of the telephone system is that the landline is our best way of gathering intelligence, gathering information on potential <laughs> criminals. And if this gets privatized, we will not have access to means of actually enforcing the law or gathering information on, on, on criminals or potential criminals. And I would never have thought that one of the biggest sources of opposition to the privatization of the telephone system, the introduction of, introduction of mobile phones, was actually the country's own, own, own police force. This is something that came to me, to me as a surprise. Uh, and so those are, again, b uh, areas of real in interest for, for society that we tend to, when we're thinking about consumer interests, uh, we also ignore the fact that the state ha also has a responsibility to maintain law and order, and uh, they they would want to have the ability to to be able to do that. But they are never really part of the general con conversation on, uh, on on public policy questions. And then you have this. This is a, my best uh, kind of uh, area, which is thinking about how compl how complex the policy questions are, which is the Internet of Things uh, that. Uh, uh, things may happen in my household or new information may may be made public but, but I'm not very sure whether it's me who actually made that inf information available or my shoe was speaking to my fridge and my fridge communica communicated to the car and the car sent that information to the to the Harvard uh, uh, Center for Geographic Analysis. Uh, so, so I start to look at my shoes with some <laughs> trepidation because I don't know what my shoe <laughs> might do next, wondering who is hacking, who might be hacking my shoe. Uh, so so this, this has a great potential to scare the public, just uh, it hasn't really leaked out, I've been really taken seriously by the general public, but I could see a lot of pushback with the social movements uh, around the Internet of Things. We've seen elements of that with regard to a uh, smart grid uh, of uh, people being worried that uh, the, the, Utilities may be robbing them in the first place, but now they know exactly where they are. <laughs> uh, and that information could be hacked and somebody could go break into a house because they, they, they again comes back to the question of trust, whether they trust the utilities to, to protect the data or, or not. And uh, there's a big debate, deep, big debate in that area where it has huge implications for energy conservation, huge benefits. 
but then you have pushback. We saw this in the Netherlands, where there's a lot of enthusiasm for, green, uh, for smart grids, and suddenly in a year or two, the public was pushing back because of the privacy, uh, the privacy questions. And you can generalize this in a wide, in a wide range of areas. And, and, and my, my last area of, of a kind of speculation here has to do with, a, with this virtual identities. Uh, whether uh, when we start to think about our presence on the web, whether that's us or that identity on the web is its own uh, personality and it should be considered legally independent of me. Uh, now, that may not be an issue now uh, when we are controlling everything that we do. But when we start to have very complex interactions between your various activities, consolidated into a data set somewhere, uh, and acting as if it was almost autonomous, uh, governed by artificial intelligence uh, algorithms. Uh, I think we are going to start seeing lawyers debating on whether uh, virtual identities are independent of us, and they should be sued independently if you are going to sue them. Uh, in the same way as we've constructed this idea of corporate identities, uh, where, the, where corporations have their own personality and they are sued independent of the shareholders who, who have created that company, uh, whether we are leading in that direction or not. Uh, I'm just, re right now I'm just speculating. And so, so I would like to conclude by connecting this really with a J Jonathan's really excellent presentation at the opening of yesterday, uh, where it really falls that we need to step back a little bit and start to look at these issues in the context of jurisprudence, how they relate to the, the general principles we understand in law that guide the way we deal with public policy, or whether these geospatial technologies are forcing us to think about new uh, principles of, of jurisprudence that can be added to the way we govern public affairs. Uh, I don't know if there are many people who have done uh, that exercise yet. Uh, we are seeing some really interesting thinking going on in the area of genomics that I'm involved in, to a point where people are starting to speculate that maybe we need a new regime of property called genetic property uh, that is di distinct from other forms, uh, forms of property that could be governed differently. Uh, we've already created new regimes of property rights that govern new innovations like integrated circuits that govern differently from copyright and patents. Are we entering a space where we, we need to be developing new principles that govern uh, this area of geospatial because of its unique, unique attributes? Uh, and, and the second question is, uh, is, the, is the thinking anticipatory enough uh, to deal with it without having this basically settled by Supreme Courts around the world? Because uh, if, if that becomes the case, uh, the general tendency is to impose existing a jurisdiction or so jurisprudence on new technologies uh, rather than develop uh, new approaches. And I think the onus is really on the members of this community to think about new approaches and, and, and actually put them forward. Uh, and uh, if we are lucky, we could actually be saved. Uh, I don't know. Uh, let me see if. Uh <laughs> quite be sure what happens after that and that's 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 the thought I would like to leave you with so thank you thank you again for being here <laughs> Professor, thank you. That, was a, that was a great talk a great summary of, of the past day and a half you raised some interesting questions I, I wonder where we are in that, in that, uh, in that <laughs> video, yes. though. You could, there's a couple of different ways you could look at yes, it. Yes, so. exactly. That's Thank the purpose. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think that concludes, well, it concludes our formal session here. Um, I want to thank everyone, all the panelists, um, all the co-hosts, USGIF for co-sponsoring. Um, from, from my standpoint, I think it was a fantastic discussion of some of the issues that 
I think the geospatial community has been dealing with for a couple of years, but more importantly is going to be dealing with over the next five to ten years. And I, um, as a lot of the speakers have said, through if we can sort of bring the various aspects of the community together, the technology community, the policy community, academic community, the government, industry, even representatives from NGO and in the, in the, in the crowd to come together to talk about these issues. Um, I encourage universities to start, you know, incorporating this into their, into their curriculum because I think it's an important part of it as well and I think the professor mentioned that too. So um, I believe we have, the, we have the map competition now outside. We're going, to, we're going to award prizes to the two uh, top posters okay. and we have a reception. Okay, is that, is, I didn't hear the award, we're going to award it out. We're here to finish part here to announce the prizes, right? Yep. Oh, okay, great. Okay, right. so that's what I'm going to do now. Okay.